Good. In fact, if you could, it looks like I'm coming through just loud and clear. If somebody could give me a confirmation of that, I'd appreciate it. Just make sure we're good here. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Hope you've all had a great week. It has been... Uh, how is Seattle today? It's like it is most other days, cloudy. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of a, a little bit of rain. It wasn't rain this morning, but it had rained overnight at some point, so uh, it was wet, which is just status quo. So <laughs> nothing new. The market's got interesting, Noah. In the last couple of days, especially this morning. I don't know if y'all watching it, but it's selling off. It was down about 30 at one point. And uh, just a little bit ago, and in, in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes maybe, we've bounced back up. It's only it's, it's cut that in half, so it's getting interesting. It's getting very, very interesting to see what's happening. So um, it will be interesting to see if things um, bounce from where they're at today. If today... If this rally continues through the rest of the day and it closes up here, even if it's only down, if the SPX is only down five points or, or ten points, we're going to have a hammer type of pattern. So, um, but that's all based on how it closes, obviously. So we're still, what are we, four hours, five hours away still? So it's a lot of time. And considering we're an hour and a half in and we've had the swing that we've had already, is, um, it's going to be a wild day is what it looks like. So. Anyway, with that being said, welcome out to the Market Mashup. Glad you're all here. And uh, let's get right to all the legal stuff, get that out of the way at least. Basically, we're not registered for broker dealers, investment advisors. I'm not going to give you any recommendations or advice. Everything that we do here is purely educational. So uh, if I do mention a trade, just assume that it is. A, if I forget to say paper, unfunded, or practice trade, uh, assume that it is. For regulatory reasons, we do not discuss uh, live funded trading here. So, Also, we are not subject to restrictions, as you can see in the last paragraph. So I could be in a trade, out of a trade, looking at a trade, thinking about a trade, dreaming about a trade at any time. So if you're new to the mashup, then there is the agenda for the next 45 minutes to an hour. And then if you're thinking it's a blank screen, that is the agenda. That's what, in my opinion, has made this class fun. Um, there is no agenda. We do whatever we want to do. We talk about whatever we want to talk about. We talk about trades, market conditions, uh, mindset, anything. Anything that comes up, anything's on the table, whether it's strategy-related, um, technical analysis, mindset, really doesn't matter. So nothing is off-limits here. So. So what do you guys want to talk about? I mean, do I have to come up with it? Because I can. But if there's something, uh, oh, yeah, it made a nice. Oh, nice, played a little fade, huh? Yeah, it's been a, um, it's been a good morning, especially if uh, in the last day or two or three days, three trading days, two or three tra trading days, if you load it up on the put side, then you could have been bailing this morning with some healthy profits on some stuff. Um, <clears throat> still might happen. Who knows what the end of the day is going to bring. But it is exceptionally volatile right now. Um, the swings are quick and wild. And, uh, I mean, just look at the S&P. You know, not even an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, it was down 30. Here about... A a minute or two ago, it was down 15. Now it's down almost 20. So I mean, it's swinging four or five points in just a minute or two. So uh, yeah, it's 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 crazy. Um, yes, I do know what you mean, Scott. Scott says I like the mindset stuff. Tell us how you went from emotional trading to systematic. It is interesting. I would agree. Trade systematically, but still some days get butterflies. Do I know what you mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Especially, 
especially on day <laughs> the last couple of days has been a perfect example is you know you when things look like they're going to head one direction and you load up yeah there's butterflies I, I don't care who you are or how long you've been doing it you're going to get some butterflies there's no doubt um, so those are never going to go away it's no different than really I mean if you know anybody or if you've ever done any public speaking um, Every time you go up on stage, and I don't care who you are, even I remember seeing an interview with Bill Clinton years and years and years ago. You know, I mean, how many speeches has that guy given? And he says, you know, you always get a little bit nervous, regardless of who you are, or where you've been, or what you've done. I mean, it's the same thing with trading. It never really goes away completely. There's always, there's always that little bit of um, nervousness that, that kicks in. So. Um, don't expect to have it go away. Just it, it's a lot of it is accepting that. I mean that's one thing right there, and it's not uh, a lot of it really is just accepting the fact that you're never going to get rid of your emotions. The best you're going to do is learn to control them. You know, I hear people say, "Well, you got to trade without emotion," and I'm like, it's "Just I laugh at that anymore because I tried that for years, and it's just not possible. We're just not hardwired that way." So, um, first of all, accept the fact that. You're an emotional being. You are. You don't hear that. I don't know what was just reached, but I don't know, something on Walmart. Um, we're emotional beings. We always have been. We always will be. And the reality is that for the most part, I don't care who you are, where you're from, male, female, doesn't matter. We all have the same emotions. It's how we respond to them that is different. And learning to respond to them in a positive way is what's important with respect to trading and learning to, um, I think the biggest thing with respect to getting systematic is not necessarily, I mean, I could give you, <coughs> I could give you a step-by-step -step system, to, but that's not necessarily what's going to work for you. But what I prefer to do is, is talk about just overall concepts. And here's the, the larger picture, and here's what you need to get better at. Really, one of the big things for me was learning to accept the reality of not only the emotions, but the trading isn't about being right or wrong. Trading is about odds. It's two main things, and really, it's really when you get down to the core of it, it's really one thing. It's managing your emotions. Everything else is, is peripheral. It's just kind of on the outside. It's, um, you know, the odds thing. We talk about odds a lot because odds is absolutely critical. If you put the odds on your side, it doesn't matter how right or wrong you are all the time, or then it won't. It doesn't mean a thing. When I first started, I remember thinking, if I could just be right 70, 80 percent of the time, I'll make a fortune. So my goal was to be right 70 or 80 percent of the time. When the reality is that Number one, that's virtually impossible. I mean, if you're doing spreads or certain strategies, you can do that, but it still doesn't matter because the odds aren't there. Even at 80% right with spreads, you're still going to lose money. But recognizing and accepting the fact that odds was a critical piece to long-term overall success was the first step. But then once you do that and you recognize that odds are that critical, they're that important, and that's really what trading is about, then you recognize that that one simple subject, one thing, just just a matter of putting the odds on your side will do so much for managing your emotions that it's not even funny. I mean, it blew my mind. When I went from <coughs> trading, excuse me, without with the risk-reward issue not really being a part of my trading plan, to only trading with risk reward, and when I had that, you know, that, that that aha moment where I had both, where I had some trades, where I was just winging it, I didn't have a plan in place, I didn't have the odds on my side, it was just I was throwing trades out there that looked good and I thought they were good, and it's not that they weren't good, but I didn't have the odds on my side. And then when I saw the contrast between the two and how it affected me emotionally, I went, wow. Why am I even trading like that? Why am I even doing this? I shouldn't be placing trades.
and that's when I shifted gears and I got to do this. I can't go the other way. It's just ridiculous to trade like this. So once you come to terms with that, I think that's where it makes it easier to shift gears, if you will. Bear with me just a second here. Uh, shifting some things around here. Oh, come on. Okay, there we go. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Scott. Uh, let's see, other question. Brenda, good question. Um, no. <laughs> you want an explanation, right? So Brenda's question is this, and it is it really is a phenomenal question. It's a common question. Um, almost everybody asks good questions. So, um, so been doing practice trades, but hesitate on real trades. Should I keep practicing until more ready? The reason you're hesitating on real trades, on funded trades, is because they're funded. <laughs> and I hate to say it, I mean the reality is that you're not going to get better at handling your emotions with practice trades. It's it's just not realistic because there's no money at stake. Um, until you're, I mean, it's kind of like saying, you know, you can go out in the field and you can, you know, you can practice and get fired upon and, you know, have bullets flying around, but you know that there's not a real enemy there and they're not actually trying to kill you, they're just trying to prepare you. Uh, but once you get in a real firefight, I mean, I've never done this, I uh, sadly never served in the military, it's one of my very few regrets in life. Um, but I know plenty of people that have. I've got tons of cousins and relatives that have been, and just seeing stories, you know, real life documentaries about stuff. But when you're in a real firefight where you have a real enemy that's really actually trying to kill you, and it's not just preparation and planning, it's a different ball game. You know, the prepping and planning and, and practicing and can only take you so far. I mean, you can use the sports analogy too. Same thing in football. I mean, you can practice all day long. But until you're in the game, and it's why so many teams, you know, going to the playoffs and doing, getting those few extra um, games in at the end of the season gives you real life experience. You get game situational experience, not only more real life experience, but you get um, higher pressure real life experience, if you will. Because once you get in there, I mean, NFL, whatever whatever league you're talking about, even high school football, anything, is when you go to the playoffs, there's more pressure there because now there's something at stake. It's not just a regular season game. Because if you lose, you're done. Regular season game, you're still going to play the next week. So, yeah, I mean, it's – what I would suggest is if you're still hesitating on real trades, then – the question becomes why. Why are you hesitating on funded trades still? And it's probably one of two things. Either you have too much at risk, you have too much at stake, or you're still not at a point where you're, and I don't know, this is what's hard to say because I don't know where you're at. I mean, only you can answer this. You're still not there yet as far as being able to just let go and let things happen the way they're supposed to. And that, that's hard to do. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm – and most people are. I was just thinking about this this morning. Is Most of us like to control things. We want to have control over things. And I'm going to venture to guess that most of you that are here are the same way because you're here – working at trading, so maybe you don't have to have a boss. You don't have to go into a job. 
because somebody else is controlling your future, your financial life, where you're learning to trade so you can take control of it. Some of us are more controlling than others. It's part of my nature to be more controlling. And so, yeah, one of the hard things for me was letting go and accepting the fact that the market's going to do what it's going to do. And you have no control over it. All you can do is react to it. You just sit back. You can analyze things to the bone. You can sit and just watch. You can do all kinds of different things. But when it comes right down to it, the best, the only thing you can do with respect to trading is analyze things to the best of your ability, plan out a trade, put in a solid plan that puts the odds on your sides, and then run with it and just let it play out. And whatever happens, happens. Because you don't have any control over the market. And that's probably, that may be one of the things that's, that's making you nervous is that you put on a trade and now you have to sit and wait. I know this is hard for me. I hate it. And the hard part is the second you put the trade on, you're underwater. So the second you pull the trigger, all you see is red. And if you go do a whole bunch of trades at once, you see an entire sea of red, and you're like, ah, you're freaking out. And maybe for a few days, <laughs> I mean, just this last week, I'd load it up. And you look at it and go, man, <laughs> I'm down a few grand already? It's like, wait a minute, I just got into these things. But then you get a day like today happens, like, woo! And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, everything's fine. I was patient. I let things play out. I didn't analyze the chart well. <clears throat> let it do its thing. And next thing you know, everything's smoking along wonderfully. Yes, it is, Brenda. <laughs> I fully understand. Because it's very frustrating to see practice trades make money and then a real trades lose money. <laughs> um, it is. It's very frustrating. Um, there you go. You're on the right track. I was. I was just about to say that actually. That's. That was part of the thing. Your your, your trades are still too big. If you're trading too big. You know, go to one contract. I don't care how much money you have to trade with. If you can't control your emotions, you're not going to control them any better with 10 contracts than you are one contract or five or whatever it is. I don't care what the number is. Until you gain control of your emotions, the bigger you trade, number one, the more emotional you're going to be about it. Number two, um, the worse it's going to be because the more money you have at stake, the higher the emotional stake is, you know, the higher the emotional game is. So, yeah, I don't care if you have $5 million to play with. If you put 10 contracts in, I mean, granted, I'm exaggerating a little bit because, I mean, you put $10,000 into a trade when you have $5 million to work with, it's not really, is it really a huge ordeal, you know, if you lose 10 grand, if you got $5 million, no, but you understand the concept of what I'm saying, I think, so. Um, so then the other question I think Brenda for what she said is it's frustrating watching the practice trades make money and the fund was not then why is it that the practice trades are going well and the fund ones are not what is it that's happening with the practice trades that's not happening with the real trades And that's a, I mean, that's only something that you can answer realistically is to examine your own trades and look at them and see what it is that is happening with the practice ones that's not happening on the real ones or vice versa. Come on, these stingy guys. I can't believe this. Oh, come on. I thought Google market makers were stingy. Um, there we go. <laughs> Is it obvious what's going on right now? No, we don't do that here. 
Uh, anyway, so hopefully, Brenda, if that, that gives you an answer that you can work with. So. Absolutely, Joseph. Love the question. That's what I love about this. Just a, I mean, it's it's just a fun kind of back and forth. I'm also look at Apple, and it has been on the radar for a little bit. What are my thoughts on Apple and where it's going? Well, we've got a giant head and shoulders. It's taken a year, year and a half to form. Um, see, now I'm going to get cranky later today, but that's okay. I'm not. I am, but I'm not. See, this is where I'm going to lean on you guys, and you're going to teach me. You're going to give me my own words <laughs> to eat them. <clears throat> but Apple, I mean, as you can see, and there's a weekly chart. It's a little bit cleaner, a little neater on a weekly chart. But um, this is about as textbook ahead of shoulders as it gets. I mean, it's a, it's a long term. It's taking a lot of time to form. And you can see there's, there's really, on the weekly chart, you can see there's a head and shoulders that created the head, and you can see how that played out. But on a, from a big picture perspective, I mean, we're looking at Apple's probably headed to about 75. Now, how long will that take? It could take three months. It could take a year. It could happen in two weeks. But getting back to the daily point of view, there's the daily point of view, and clean some of this up. But I mean, Apple is essentially, it's in bearish mode, lower highs, lower lows. It's been doing that for a few months now. And looks like it wants to head south. And as you can see, there's the trading plan that I have on it with the idea that it's entirely possible that this thing could blast right through that 88.14 area and head right to 75. If this market uh, crashes or continues to fall, then Apple will probably get sucked right along with it. If the economy gets weaker, what are people going to do? Are they going to keep buying Apples and iPods? Yeah, to a certain degree, but it'll slow down. And so Apple will get beat up a little bit. But then again, Apple's got some things too that keeps them in the market where kind of like Walmart and um, – the family dollar stores that, you know, the dollar store type of things, family dollar, dollar tree, um, those types of businesses typically will do either well or okay in weak economies. Because if you can't go to Nordstrom, where do you go? You go somewhere else. You go to a JT Penney's or Kohl's or a, you know, so when people's income starts to drop or things get questionable and they start to tighten their belts, you know, you start changing your habits. And start doing things that you have to, not necessarily that you maybe want to, if that makes sense. It should, but just like, I mean, L'Oreal, I mean, um, Estee Lauder, those types of companies do well in weak economies because if you can't go out and buy a new, you know, $300 Michael Kors purse, you can still buy a 10 or 15 or $20 thing of tube of lipstick, right? I don't know how much it costs. I've never bought lipstick before, so. Actually, I take that back. I think I bought some for my mom for Christmas years ago, or my grandma or something. But it's been so long, I don't remember. So there's interesting reasons why certain companies will do well, and Apple may be one of those uh, that will probably hold up okay. But you never know, you know. And a lot of it, especially, especially if the overall market just crashes, which is entirely possible. I mean, I, I think we're in the beginning of at the very least, a, a good-sized downward trend for the next probably a year or two. We could be in the very beginnings of a crash as well, is what I'm thinking. So let's just put it this way. I'm prepared for a crash if it happens, and I won't be offended or hurt, especially if it was to happen today. But uh, we'll see. I mean, it's kind of like Amazon. And this has been kind of a weird one. At least it was the last several days. I mean, these guys have just torn it up, and they are well. They're not. What was it? Three months ago, four months ago, they came out and became the biggest retailer in the world. They overtook Walmart 
from a, I don't know if it's a revenue perspective is what they put it as, but you know they're the biggest retailer in the world. And they don't even have any retail outlets. It's all online. Um, I mean, Amazon's really, I mean, Bezos has done some absolutely phenomenal things with this, getting into the cloud and all the other stuff. It's just absolutely genius moves business-wise. And you can see, I mean, since 2009, they were 50 bucks and they hit 700. But this, like Apple, I think it's going to be in a similar situation where it will hold up, it will survive, and it will probably do well. The question is, will it get caught in the downdraft, or will they really suffer and get beat up like a lot of the other companies will? And the answer is we don't know, but as you can see, it kind of we had the whole uh, earnings deal. The big run before the earnings, this thing was up, what, 50 points? I think it was 53 points that day, the big up day, and then the next day, boom, it gaps down. It was down 60-something in the morning, I think it was. Came back, it was only down 40 for the day. But I think these two companies, along with, there's a couple of them. I mean, Google will survive and probably do well, probably thrive. Um, some of them will, will do just fine if the economy gets beat up. So hopefully that answered your question, Joseph. But yeah, as far as Apple goes, I still, I mean, the chart itself is bearish. I mean, technically speaking, this thing is headed. Um, if it gets, if it stays below this 95 area, we're looking at about 88, and then from there we're looking at 79. And the uh, the head and shoulders move should be approximately 75. So we've got basically two major support areas before we get to the target of 75, which would be the head and shoulders. So. Uh, it's pretty, Apple's pretty cut and dried, especially with that kind of pattern. So, uh, let's see. Let's get caught up here. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good idea, Scott. Scott says a system you feel confident in. Talking, referring to Brenda when we were talking about Brenda. And, um, Yeah, I like that. That's a good a good point. Is that having a system that you feel confident in? Um, and a lot of it, I'm going to guess, Brenda, is probably just a matter of I'm I'm just guessing because I don't I only know you from here being in this class and the questions and the the stuff that comes up. But um, I'm going to guess you're probably a little bit controlling. You want to control things like me. I'm the same way, so I'm not. It's like I'm more talking to myself than you. But um, we like to have control of things, and we want things to happen on our timeline and do it the way we want to, and we want things to happen the way we want them to happen. And it's hard to just release that and let things happen the way they're supposed to, and just let it go and, and let it be. Um, so it's difficult. If that's how you really are, then. Yeah, it's hard. So you've got to develop the confidence to be patient and just let things go and not worry about what's going to happen tomorrow because you can't do anything about it anyway. And it took me a while to figure out that, you know, I'd place trades and at the end of the day I'm like, and a lot of people don't hold overnight because of that. Because they don't want to have the overnight fear. They don't want to they don't want to sit there and think about it at night. And it's like I used to to a certain degree. I never really did much, but then I realized there's there's nothing I can do about it anyway. There were days where I'd have I'd get super leveraged on one side of the market, which makes me nervous. It always does, because the times I've done that, I I get beat up. But I remember getting super leveraged on one side one night, one afternoon, and all of a sudden it's like well, I'm kind of freaked. And I'm like, you know what? I can't do anything about it right now, can I? Market's closed, and I can't change direction. I can't do anything until tomorrow morning anyway. So what am I freaking out about? Why am I worried? Why am I even thinking about it? And that's when it got easier to just go, okay, there's nothing I can do anyway, so just release it, let it go. And sometimes it just takes that talk in your own mind, just go, look, I don't have any control over it. I can't do anything about it. All I can do is put it out there and let it be. And whatever happens, happens. And usually when you get to that point, you start to gain confidence because you see that your analysis – I mean, just look at your paper trades. Your paper trades are going well. 
And why is that? I'm going to venture to guess that you're relaxed about them. You're just letting them. Do, you're letting them play out. You're probably staying in them longer. You're probably holding on. If you go and, and Scott makes a point of journaling, keeping a log, and maybe you should do that. See how long you're in a paper trade versus a, a funded trade. I'll bet you that you're in a paper trade longer. In other words, you allow the paper trades to work and you allow them to play out because it's just paper so you don't worry about it so you leave it there for an extra few days. In other words, you're probably analyzing the charts just fine. Your analysis is probably perfectly fine. Your plan, everything is probably fine. It's just that you get impatient when money's on the line and your fear kicks in and you get nervous and so you make decisions that you shouldn't make that you wouldn't make on a paper trade because there's no emotions involved. I don't know. I'm just, again, I'm just taking a stab at it and maybe that's what it is, but Scott makes a point of uh, regularly documenting, keeping a log to help build confidence and get rid of bad habits, and I agree with that. I don't. I tried it years ago to do a journal and a log, and it was just for me. It just didn't. I just couldn't. I'd write it down, I'd, but I'd never go back and look at it. And some people do that, and some people don't. I just. It's not my strength. It's not one of those things that I've ever been um, good at. So maybe it's taken me longer to get where I wanted to go, but. I don't know. I just uh, I never went back to look at stuff, so it was just something that never worked for me. So okay. How do you prepare for a crash? Ooh, man, you guys are loaded up with awesome questions. Make sure your seatbelt's on. Hold on tight. Um, I think, and that's interesting. I don't know that I've had that question. I haven't, uh, I haven't really thought about it in terms of, you know, answering it, just in my own mind. Um, a lot of it, 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 and I'm just, I'm straight off the cuff here. I'm just preparing for a crash. To me, is not number one, knowing that it's a possibility. I think it's the biggest thing. Just knowing that it's, it's. It could be right around the corner. I mean, if we look at the S&P and we look at a long-term picture, and here are since 1980, basically, last 35 years. And you look at the types of rallies we had. You look at the you know the late 90s running up to 2000 before the 2000 crash. Well, this rally we've had is very similar. In fact, it's even steeper and... Um, I mean, you could say that they're about the same. You have, you know, about halfway up, right? Well, let me draw a, right there, we had a really sizable pullback, 97, 98, somewhere in there. And then it continued to rally. And you look at the ascent. In fact, it'd be interesting. It's been a long time since I've done this. Oh shoot, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this. Um, so trading on profit loss percent. Okay. So 242%. And this is just whether or not we continue the same thing. Interestingly enough, we were up from the rally, let's see, 94, basically the first of 95 up to 2000. So five years, it's up 242%. We're talking about March of 09. The high was May of 15, about six years, 215%. So very similar, right? Not, I mean, it's, yeah, 25 percentage points difference, but that's only 10% in the big scheme of things. And it took about a year longer, but okay. We also had just come off a major crash too, versus you know here we had you know from 80 to 95, we had a 15-year bullish trend. It wasn't like we just came off a major crash. So, is it going to happen again? Well, you just look at the pattern. I mean, if we get rid of those. 
And if we look at the last two times it happened, and you look at this time here, what do we have? Well, we had a head and shoulders just to the left of that box, you see. It was kind of small, and it tried to break through it. It didn't. It fight, well, it broke through briefly, but then it rallied back up. And we had this just kind of back and forth before in 2000 where it just finally rolled over and just went for it. Whoops. Whoops. You look at the start of it in 07, 08, you've got a head and shoulders pattern there. It's pretty darn good, pretty textbook. And zoom way in here. Breaks the neckline, comes back up a few months later, taps it, and then crashes from there. And what do we have going on right now? Is it a beautiful textbook head and shoulders? No, but you could say here's the left shoulder. A big, lengthy, wide head and then a right shoulder, and then we have a neckline, and what do you know, it breaks the neckline, rallies up, taps it, 1950, and then rolls over from there, and where are we right now? I mean, we're 50, 60 points below a textbook head and shoulders playing out. So there's several different things to get back to your question. I know sometimes I find squirrels and get sidetracked, but with respect to preparing for a crash, a lot of it depends on what you're doing. Right? What, what kind of trading are you doing? Are you a longer-term trader? Um, I mean, is it something that, you know, how much capital do you have? You know, if you're working with a couple thousand dollars, if you've got a small account, it might be a little more difficult. If you're working with, you know, 50, 100, 200,000 or more, could you take 10 or 20 or 30,000 dollars and buy some long-term puts on the SPY or on the SPX? I mean, you can go buy the index or go go short the index. So it really depends on what you're looking to do. But really, for me at least, for my style of trading, because I'm a short-term trader. Um. And so mainly what I'm doing is I have a bearish uh, bent, if you will. So essentially I'm staying mostly bearish. The bullish trades that I'm looking for <laughs> are typically short term. In other words, the trend, the trend is down. We're in a bearish trend. Uh, we've got lower highs, lower lows, uh, especially if the S&P breaks that 1867 again. If it cracks back through there, then we're even more bearish than we were before. So just like you might be here in this bullish trend where you're focusing on bullish trades and a majority of your trades are bullish, now we're just flipped over and the majority of my trades are bearish. And that's what I'm focused on is bearish trades. So then the reality is if, excuse me, man, I could swear the last week this cough has been fine and now it's kicking back in. Um, it's just Murphy's Law, right? Um, so if you're focused on and the majority of your trades are bearish, and then if this market crashes, then you're already in position. You're already taking advantage of it. So that's a couple of different ways that, you know, just tossing out a couple of ideas kind of off the cuff is, number one, if you've got the capital, you can throw aside some long-term bearish positions, probably some puts on the spiders, long-term, you know, leaps. Or just trade in a short term, but realize that there is a possibility. The odds are decent that we're going to have – the odds are pretty high we're going to be in a, a downtrend for a while. And I think there's a decent chance from an odds perspective that we're going to crash at some point. Whether or not it's super far or super fast, we don't know. We never know that. So hopefully that made sense and, and gave you a solid answer. If not, if you want me to clarify, then let me know what to, to clarify on. So. Um, all right, Tom. Really? Heard that Amazon's thinking about adding 400 brick and mortar bookstores. Um, yeah, that's odd. I mean, you got Barnes and Noble who has been trying forever to to keep their stores open, and from what I know, they're shutting them down right and left because they can't stay open. 
Because anybody that's going to go read books or sit in a place and read books goes to the library, right? You have a library you can go to free and you have all these books and everything else. Why would you go sit at a bookstore and pay for a book? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, yeah, that's just odd. Unless they have something else behind it. Unless it's unless it's more than just a bookstore. Which I can see I can see maybe them getting creative and doing something different than just a bookstore. If they had um, I don't know, that's interesting. I've, I haven't heard that. If they do, you can pretty much guarantee that Amazon will do something creative that would draw people in because just a standard, just opening a bookstore, just a brick-and-mortar bookstore to me makes no sense. Uh, like I say, Barnes & Noble has been going away, so. Could I update my charts? I could, or we could just look at live charts. Amazon, where is Amazon? You know, how about we do that? This market is kind of crazy right now, so let's see what's going on. <sighs> yeah, it's only down five. That's insane. Insane. Where is Amazon? When you said it was breaking down, it was breaking down. Now it's breaking up. Uh, there's Apple. Apple's bouncing back up. Um, wow. Yeah, this stuff's, uh, things are going kind of crazy now. Huh. There's the interesting one. I mean, you got gold. Typically, gold goes the opposite of what the overall market's doing, right? Um, and gold is on a tear right now. Absolutely on a tear. And so it makes you wonder, why is gold... If the, I mean, the market's rallying back, obviously, and if it is, then why is gold doing so well? Why is gold taking off and rallying? Doesn't make a ton of sense if people aren't scared or nervous about the market. Why would they be loading up? Why, why are gold stocks going crazy? So I think that's just another indication that when the market's nervous, it's on edge, and so it's hard to say what's going to happen, but and it's crazy. I'm going to look at this now. We were down 20 points when we started this class 45 minutes ago, and now we're where's the SPY? It's only down five. It was down 30 earlier this morning. I mean, there's that you can see the candle. So we've got a we've got a hammer type of pattern starting right now. The question is, where are we going to finish? And that's if you're a short-term trader, this is the, this is the kind of day that you don't like. Yesterday was beautiful because it just dropped off and sold off and kept going. But a day like today is just insane. The volatility is just crazy. Uh, you're welcome again, Joseph. Um, good, Brenda. Using pattern. Brenda says she's using patterns and flashes, helping a lot. Good. Um, didn't you get advanced trading mindset too? If not, that's something that uh, I mean, from a mindset perspective, that's all it is. It's all purely, I mean, six and a half hours of video of, of mindset, and it's, it's the same type of concepts that, you know, we talk about here is, you know, number one, odds, keeping the odds on your side. Um, scaling is a huge one. Huge one, especially, in, especially on a day like today. Well, take this one, for example. I mean, this is... Um, 8 ZNP. This is a practice trade I did. Right? Picked up some uh, paper contracts at 275. Threw an order out there. I think this is one that hit. Threw an order out for 350. And it was puts right in it. When it hit the low here today, as you can see on the right there, it triggered the order. Well, I mean, now the options changed by a buck 40. So close out part of the position with a decent sized profit, which reduces the cost basis on the other half. So when something like this happens, I mean, you can see the first part, if we look at the intraday chart, I mean, you look at this in the morning, if you had puts, especially if you got in a couple of days ago, you hit 17.50, you hit 15.50, you're like, woo! And here we are an hour and a half later and you're freaking out. 
because you were spectacular. You're in a great profitable position this morning, 45 minutes into the market, because this is a 15-minute chart. So the first 45 minutes, you're happy, or first hour, I guess, because, and then an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes later, you're flipping out because your profit just went bye-bye, and you're actually underwater. Whereas if you took out part of the position down here when it when it was dropping, then you're probably either break even or, you know, the the pain's not as bad when it reverses like it has. Same thing with a lot of these. I mean, a lot of these things have really just gone kind of berserk to the upside. I mean, same with Netflix. I don't know if you all saw this. Netflix was down four or five bucks this morning. Same type of thing. I mean, you can see my the trading plan I have on here. Another one to put a practice trade on. <coughs> Huge potential. 21 bucks of potential here. Put a practice trade on that orange line, and this morning it was like, woo, this thing's awesome. And then now, with the rally, it's coming back that, you know, it hit 86, it's up four bucks, basically, in the last, I'll change that to a five, in the last, what, hour? Hour and a half? Massive change in swing, same thing with Baba, Alibaba. This one's just lovely. This is one that moved enough, though, I mean, it was um, another paper trade, the options were 750 when it hit the 66.31 yesterday, and they hit 11.50 this morning when it dropped off. And this one's not as dramatic as a lot of the others, but Walmart's one looking for a bounce back and this one might be and here's one here's a here's a potential still. It's a candidate right now. Because you can see how bullish my uh Walmart's gotten. The two big candles yesterday kind of stalled out. Today it's selling off and right now it's leaving the type of pattern whereas if this thing starts to rally and closes up near that entry of 67.35, if it gets up in that area, I mean, this looks beautiful for a bullish move if the market really drops a hammer. If it drops that kind of a pattern, then odds are the next few days it's going to rally. So it might be worth taking you know, a short-term risk on some, some calls on the upside if that's what happens, but it's really going to depend on how it closes out. And we're two hours into the market. We've been down 30 and up 5 or 10. So... It's a wild, wild day. Lots of big, big swings. So, yeah, exactly, Brenda. What will be, will be. Attention, an alert target has been reached. Yeah, it's a good point. Scott says, yeah. Another thing is that. Only, but basically, I, I'm going to kind of paraphrase here: is that you only put you only put the kind of risk out in the market that you can take a 50% hit on, or basically whatever you're comfortable with. And that's on the, the the questionnaire that I built for myself was the last question is: Am I comfortable with the amount of risk that I'm taking here? In other words, if you know here is my potential loss, and I'm fully aware that it might get worse than that. And am I okay with that? Am I okay giving the market 300 bucks? If it, if this trade goes against me and I have to get out, I might lose $300. Am I okay with that? Now, if I can't say yes to that, then there's one of two things. Either I've got too much risk on the table or I just shouldn't do the trade. I mean, that's really all it comes down to. So, and yeah, I mean, we all have to kind of figure that out for ourselves, so... I do know what you mean, so yeah. I'm not sure, Scott. Um, Scott's asking about Kerry, one of the instructors. And I don't know if he went back to being a doctor or not. I haven't uh, I haven't seen or talked to him in probably five years. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, what he's up to. Um, I lost touch with a lot of people, so... What did I miss, Jim? I'm not sure what you – Jim said I saw that on the CNBC website this morning. I'm not sure what um, – oh, the 400 stores? Oh, that's a good point. That's what I was trying to figure out is what, what would make – why would 
why would you open four brick and mortar stores or, or bookstores? But yeah, that would that would make sense actually to make them like miniature distribution centers. <coughs> and there's the other thing I know they've been they've they've been talking about, and that might be playing right into that strategy too, is that using drones for deliveries. You know, so you can you can order something and have it delivered within an hour or two. You know, with where I live, actually, I, I don't live that far from um, a, a. It's almost it's not. I don't know if it's a worldwide hub, but there's a lot of um, worldwide headquarters of a lot of companies right in the valley near where I live. Um, and there's tons of warehouses, tons of that kind of space, and I had no idea that. There's as many companies down there as there are. They're worldwide headquarters, and it's kind of crazy to think about it. Um, and, I mean, Amazon's here. Amazon's right um, downtown Seattle. They just built a brand-new campus. In fact, it's driving the it's driving the rent rates in Seattle just nuts. I, mean, I talked to a guy that's a landlord. He's got a few properties there up on Capitol Hill and right near where they just built that big campus down by Lake Union. Well, this guy's got a 650-square-foot apartment, one-bedroom apartment, 650 square feet. He's paying twenty two hundred bucks a month, twenty two or twenty five. I think it was twenty two hundred. Twenty two hundred bucks a month for a, a one bedroom apartment, six hundred and fifty square feet. And his lease was up. He told his landlord, "I want to go month to month because I might move." He goes, "Okay, it's going to be twenty eight hundred if you want to go month to month." <laughs> and he's like, "Well, huh?" He goes, "It's okay if you want to leave. That's okay." I'll just I'll just jack it to 3,300 for whoever comes in, because the there's so little demand or so little supply there, because of the demand that Amazon put in on housing up there, with bringing in new people. I heard they're hiring 500 people a week. <laughs> well, you hire 500 people a week, and even if 100 of them there, they all need a place to live. So 33, can you imagine paying 3,300 bucks for a one bedroom apartment that's not even a thousand square feet? It's to me, it's insane. I just can't imagine it. It's part of the reason why traffic's so horrendous in the Seattle area. It's just nuts because nobody wants to pay that. You can buy a seven hundred thousand dollar house for with have that kind of mortgage. It's insane. <coughs> but uh, of course, I hear seven hundred thousand dollars doesn't get you a lot. <laughs> we're, we're we're like San Fran, pretty much. So not only in housing prices, but politically, we're getting there too. So anyway, um, but yeah, that might play right into the strategy of. Um, Point. It might be a distribution point where not only can they distribute, people can pick stuff up, but they can then use drones to deliver packages. So those that don't have the patience to wait for a day or two for a package because, oh my gosh, I need it right now, they can order from Amazon and Amazon can drop it on your doorstep with a drone in an hour. Which I think is a little insane because for me, if I need something that bad, uh, there's a store right down the road. Why would I get on? I mean, I'm not that lazy. I don't know if it's laziness or efficiency where some people don't want to get in their car and drive down to the store and buy what they need. I don't know. Maybe I'm just old-fashioned. <laughs> mm -hmm. GLD. Is that gold? What is that? It seems like that's all. Yeah, that's gold. Yeah, gold's taken off. I mean, there's a perfect example right there of exactly what's happening with gold. See, Walmart is, I like the looks of this, even though, I mean, regardless of how you feel about Walmart, actually, I like Walmart. I go there because they have the best prices on stuff. I can get the same thing for 20% less than anywhere else. Um, But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this day finishes out because here, I mean, again, it's extremely volatile. Just a few minutes ago, it was down five, and now we're down 12. You know, it is moving uh, extremely rapidly and making major, major shifts, major swings just back. In the, and this is th these are the types of days where having control of your emotions – and utilizing some of those skills that I talk about in advanced trading mindset, like scaling, days like today are where they come in extremely handy. Because like I said, I mean, getting out of, and there's several of these, I mean, you can see some of the paper trades I have on. Some of them hit this morning. I went, you know what, I'm going to scale out of some of these. Get out of, close out some of the position just in case it turns around. And then if it keeps diving, if it keeps tanking, then awesome. 
I'm still making money. If it turns around, then at least I've banked some profit and reduced my cost basis on the other part of it, so it's not so bad. And so it allows me to hang on through these wild swings because now I'm not worried about it. Yeah, will I maybe take a hit on some of them? Yes, but I've mitigated that loss. I won't lose as much as I would have before. Whereas something like Alibaba, I mean, this is one that, you know, you pick them up at 750 and sell off half of them at basically 11 bucks. I mean, the cost basis on the remainder is two and a half bucks a contract, two and a half bucks a share. They're trading for 1020. I, I I can't lose money on this until that option goes to two dollars and fifty cents. Can't lose play money, of course. So I mean, it's got to basically drop about seven bucks, which means the stock has to run about ten or fifteen points, which means it would have to go to about seventy-five, which is not likely to happen and not likely to happen quickly. So basically, with the the practice trade I did on Baba, I mean, the odds of me taking a loss on this are almost nil. Almost none. Uh, it's virtually impossible. And you can see the intraday chart in the bottom right where it's sold off big time and it's bouncing back, but the volume's drying up, which is a bear sign. You look at Netflix, similar type of thing. We've got a falling three methods that showed up yesterday on Netflix. Worked out perfect because it landed right on the entry point. This morning sold off quick, and it's doing the same thing as Baba. Sold off with big volume, lots of momentum. It's rallying back, but look at the volume drying up. In that bottom right corner, you can see the volume is getting lighter and lighter, substantially lighter on the bullish move. We're hitting the 20 bar moving average on an intraday chart, which may or may not mean anything, but it's stalling out, as you can see. So Walmart is, we'll see how this one closes out, but it's done the same thing. Sold off with big volume, dropped a little hammer, rallied back up, but the volume is not that solid on the rally back to the upside. So... Of course, these are some of the little guys, but I mean, gold is just taking off, and so we'll see what's the Apple doing. And I got to wrap up actually. This is what makes it hard too to get in, because when do you get into Apple? If you want to play the downside and it looks bearish, and you see I've got a plan there in place that 93.71 is the entry, 88 is the target, so you got about four and a half bucks of potential. Actually, that's five and a half. But when do you pull the trigger and get in? And that's the hard part. Hard part is when do you suck it up and say, okay, I'm going to do it now. Because if you wait till it starts to drop, especially with the market being as volatile as it is, see, I think I have the VIX. Yeah, the VIX is up. No surprise. But um, when volatility is going like this, it's hard to pull the trigger. But sometimes the best time to pull the trigger is the opposite time you would think it is. Like Walmart is a perfect example. And really, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up with this because I think I started thinking about this yesterday, looking through charts. Today, especially this morning, an hour and a half ago, is the time when most people think, okay, it's time to get into puts. And that's the initial reaction, the initial emotional response is, now is the time. It's dropping. It's dropping. Let's get into puts. But the reality is, I started looking yesterday for call opportunities, for bounces. In other words, a sell-off like this, a 30-point sell-off one day, 35 or 40 one day, and then 30 points the next day, typically doesn't stay down that long. It's oversold. It happens so quick, so fast. That is a lot of times an opportunity to find a, a bullish trade, find something to get into and trade the upside because the odds are that the market's going to bounce. The odds are that it's not going to stay down there. The odds are that we were going to have a bounce like we've had just in the last hour, hour and a half because it was so oversold. It sold off so quickly. So you need to start thinking the opposite of what the natural reaction is. Recognize the natural reaction is one thing, and you probably should do the opposite. Walmart's a perfect example. This is one that, and that was part of the reason I paused earlier. I did a paper trade on Walmart just this morning right there near the bottom. It was about 65 and a half, 65.40. Pulled the trigger and just and picked up a bunch of contracts, just unloaded them with a 20 cent profit. Threw an order out there for a 20 cent profit. It rallied up, tagged it probably 40 minutes ago. 
And I was a little cranky because it's even more profitable now than it was when I got out, but that's okay. I don't care. It was a quick, you know, an hour-long trade that I made a decent chunk of change on very quickly. And it was just nothing more than counterintuitive move. Saying, okay, it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping. Normally, this would be a place where a lot of people would get into puts, but now's the time to get into calls because it's probably going to change direction. So as much as the market looks bearish, I'm looking for potential call opportunities. That's why I'm looking at Walmart as a possibility. If it closes up here between that red and orange line, I'm going to look at maybe scaling in and taking a small position on you know, a small paper trade on the bullish side and then see what happens tomorrow. If it takes off and runs, awesome. If not, okay. And part of it is I'm loaded up so heavily on the bearish side with paper trades that I want to make sure that if the market does take off, I don't get too beat up on that side. So I try to keep it balanced as much as possible. But with that, I know I am fresh out of time. I'm actually over time. So give you a little bit of this. The Market Insights is my video commentary. I do two or three days a week. And similar to the type of stuff we see today, basically just looking at um, – you're welcome, Brenda. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Um, and basically just go look at candidates, just like here. I mean, here's all the – these are all the big guys. Here's potential trades. Um, we'll sometimes discuss the paper trades that are done, but just looking through a lot of them and little guys also looking at some of the smaller dollar stocks. I'm uh, getting kind of cranky with HCMB. That thing just won't stop right now, and it's making me a little cranky, but it is what it is. Nothing I can do about it. So uh, basically, those are all the candidates. And on extreme charts, you may have seen that. This is essentially, and I use this mostly, and you can see, I mean, basically, I don't know why that was. Oh, that's right. I skipped over that one. You see the trading plans are in place. I put the orange, green. The red is the stop. The green is the target, and orange is the entry point based on a 4 to 1 risk reward. And so you can see there's Bristol Myers. You know, triggered an entry point yesterday and the two days before that. But today you'd be extremely happy, right? It's down two bucks, or at least it was a little while ago. You'd be halfway to the target, probably would have closed out half your position or part of the position at least. And even if it bounces back, you're okay with it. DuPont has taken off. It, it hit the entry point yesterday. I mean, these are all things that I put out. I say, here's potential candidates. Here's some trades that may work out. They may or may want to take them. You may not. There's Dollar Tree. It's getting beat up today, but it's bouncing back as well. So EIX, this is one that triggered, uh, well, last Friday. Been on the radar for a couple of weeks. Here's another one. I mean, ETR. Again, these have been on the radar for a while. It triggered last Friday, and it just hit the target. Well, it hit the target yesterday and the day before, basically. FL, that's going the opposite. I mean, and basically, here's another one, HCA that's all working out exactly the way the plan is laid out. There's another one. Well, this one's aluminum is hard. The the spreads were real big. I looked at it yesterday, and the spreads were giant on it. So, but essentially, it's just me going through and saying, here's what I see. Here's the potential. Here's the possibility. Here's what you may want to consider. Here's things to be concerned about. And it's it's just a commentary. Um, but that's essentially what the insights are. So, seven ninety five a quarter. And you get that. And then the other two products I have are Patterns in a Flash and Advanced Trading Mindset. Referred to it a little bit earlier. Brent is using Patterns in a Flash. It's all technical analysis. Right? It's six and a half hours of video about patterns. There's flashcards in there that uh, train your eyes to recognize the patterns. And then there's the quiz, of course, which allows you to get feedback as to what you did or did not learn and allows you to go back and look. Advanced Trading Mindset is all purely about mindset. I mean, it's pretty much all we talked about today, but it's six and a half hours of video purely focused on not only the the mindset that we bring to the market, the things that we are raised with for the most part. Most of us get very similar types of ideas and mentalities, and it's not that they're bad. It's that we use them improperly. It's like trying to take a, a flathead screwdriver out with a Phillips screwdriver. I mean, that's essentially what we do. We bring a, a Phillips mentality for a flathead screw. And we've got to learn to shift and adjust and take that tool and use the proper tool, or use it properly, I should say. So, uh, and you'll notice each of those, all three of them are independent tools. I'll show you how you can get them in a bundle in a second, but they're 229. But the beauty is, it's not per quarter. If you look at the very bottom of that screen there, you'll see it says renew each for just $99 per quarter. So once you get it, so if you get it for 229 today, then at the end of a quarter in three months, when the subscription is up, 
if you want to keep it, it's just 99 to keep it active. So you can have it for another quarter for just 99. So and I've got students that have had this for four or five years. And they just keep it active because it's great reference. They go back and reference it. So, uh, but there you have it with those two. And then if you want to get the bundle, all three, I always run out of time to go through that testimonial, but you can get all three, the Market Insights, Patterns of Flash, and Advanced Trading Mindset for only 9.95. So if you bundle it up and get all three, that is the best deal, uh, best value that you can get. So, so that is it. Appreciate you all hanging out and having fun. Appreciate the questions. Awesome questions today. I mean, they always are. You guys are always have great, great questions. So um, look forward to the next time, and we'll see you all down the road. You all take care. Bye-bye.